All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining this morning uh, for our bonus presentation for the third week of the Adaptation Planning and Practices for, carbon, for Forest Carbon Management uh, course. Um, in this bonus presentation, as you can see, I'm gonna discuss a little bit about some of the climate change impacts uh, that we've been thinking about in the course and try to draw some more direct connections to carbon in forest ecosystems. Like a lot of this course though, um, as you'll see over the, uh, the next uh, half an hour or so, um, we're gonna be kind of speaking in broad brush terms. Um, you know, the, the actual numbers, the quantification of those impacts is oftentimes a, a, a very determined by the site, by the site conditions. Um, so we're gonna be kind of just making the linkages to, to the carbon dynamics, to carbon fluxes and systems um, and, and not getting so much into, into the quantification of them. <clears throat> um, just a reminder that when we're talking about carbon or carbon benefits here, um, as, as most of you will recall, you know, we're really talking about both carbon storage in the system, so the amount of carbon that's retained in the various pools in the forest, as well as as fluxes and, and importantly, the, the um, carbon sequestration, the ability of forests to remove carbon from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. So really, as you kind of, uh, as we go through these different impacts, I think it'll be fairly clear, but, but you know, remember to, to kind of be thinking about, well, is this connected to storage, sequestration, both? Um, and, and sometimes it's, you know, I'll mention that sometimes it's, it's oftentimes implied. So the format I'm gonna use just to kind of make things maybe a little more interesting and fun um, is we're gonna be talking a lot about the shifts of, of climate, um, both in the shifting seasons, shifting patterns of, of, um, of weather, of precipitation, of, of temperature, uh, shifting species and then shifting stressors. So kind of uh, working along this theme here throughout the, the presentation. So the first thing um, to talk about with shifting seasons as you know, we're, we're in spring here, we're just at the kind of starting to, to see, uh, at least here in Southern Maine where I am, the, the lilacs in my yard, the, the, the buds are expanding. We're starting to see some green. Um, and, and so that's really a reminder about the shifting um, seasonality, uh, longer growing seasons. Um, this map that I'm showing here is from a paper, from a, a Keenan et al. paper, which was um, published in 2014. And so, you know, the, the data in this paper is almost 10 years old. They're, they were, we're looking at onset of spring um, observations uh, through 2012. Um, and so what, you know, what we're showing here in, in the forested ecosystems um, as being shown on the map here is in some places up to, you know, a week or more earlier onset of spring, although, you know, a lot of spatial variability in that. <clears throat> and, and that pattern, of course, just continues um, over, over the intervening you know, decades since, since those observations were made. <clears throat> There's been a number of projections to, um, you know, we can take those, those climate models and we can look at sort of temperature projections and understand kind of how is the frost free season or the growing season length projected to change. Um, so here's data from, uh, from Michigan State and GLISA. Um, that were put together for, for us for another project, um, really for, for the Midwest region. Um, and you can see here for, for mid-century for the high emission scenario, uh, about roughly four weeks longer growing season um, compared to the period from uh, 1979 to about 19 uh, to 2019. Um, and then looking towards 
the end of the century for that same high emission scenario, and, you know, almost a doubling of that increase. So almost eight weeks more uh, longer of a, of a growing season compared to that uh, reference period. And then when you look at, uh, at kind of the whole uh, lower 48, um, this is a map from the fourth national climate assessment that came out in 2018. You know, you can see pretty, a pretty consistent across all of the Eastern US of about 20 to 30 days uh, in that kind of in that um, range uh, increase uh, for, for mid-century compared to, and you can see this is a slightly different baseline period of 1976 to 2005. Um, but still, you know, kind of aligning. So these are different climate models, um, different ensembles of climate models used, um, um, but roughly kind of getting the same, the same uh, results in terms of the cha change in the length of the growing season. So obviously earlier onset of spring, also kind of a, a later uh, cessation of growth in the fall, this all just means you know, there's more time for, for forests to be growing. There's more uh, opportunity for carbon uptake in forests. And indeed, you know, we do, when you look at kind of trends in forest productivity, you know, those trends are, 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 are trending longer, you know, uh, more, uh, more carbon uptake. Now, linking it directly or at, at attributing that kind of trend line um, specifically to longer growing seasons is, is, a, is a challenge. You know, there's a lot of change happening and, and some of that uh, trend line is likely being driven, you know, also just by, you know, the, the um, forest stand dynamics as, you know, forests are, are um, you know, kind of maturing from, uh, from defore or from, you know, agricultural abandonment, regrowing and, and those sorts of things. So, so a direct, a direct attribution of that trend to longer growing season is, is really a challenge to do. But, you know, in general, you know, we can kind of uh, make uh, some fairly confident assumptions that, you know, that that longer span of time is uh, equating to at currently, you know, more carbon uptake. <clears throat> so that's the good. The flip side of the longer growing season, the bad part is shorter, warmer winters. Now, <clears throat> you know, for, for those who, who have to, to shovel snow, this is a picture of me at uh, my, my former residence in the UP digging through a, um, a, a snow bank um, to get from my garage to my house. Uh, you know, shorter, warmer winters on that day didn't seem like such a bad thing. But from you know from a forestry standpoint, um, there's there's a lot of uh, negative impacts that that really can result in in some uh, noticeable uh, risks to, to carbon sequestration and, and to tree health from those shorter warmer winters. So one thing is increases in freeze thaw cycles. You know, so you have those cold nights and then you get warm sunny days. Great for for uh, producing you know maple syrup when you get those freeze thaw cycles, um, but you can also get some damage of trees that result from that. So you can get frost cracking of bark, um, shown in that upper image where you get those vertical cracks that can form, um, and obviously those are opportunities for a tree to get um, uh, damage from decay fungi from boring insects attacking. Um, and getting into the cambium, which can obviously increase mortality rates in trees. Also, those freeze thaw cycles, you can get a, you can get frost heaving, um, particularly when you have a lack of snowpack, and that's another one of those impacts from from warmer winters is that we're just seeing, you know, a shorter duration of of time that snows on the ground. We're also seeing um, you know, uh, just a, a, a smaller snow pack, so you know, uh, less snow depth as well. And, and of course that snow insulates the soil um, and prevents it from, from freezing or from uh, getting, you know, getting frost heaving when you get the, the temperature swings. 
So that frost heaving can result in injury and severing um, of, of fine roots. Um, and so when you're, you know, when you get that increased root injury, injury um, in those shallow fine roots of trees, that really can impact the, uh, the ability of the trees to uptake nutrients. Um, that can impact, you know, branch growth, can impact uh, tree health, um, and really just, you know, canopy quality obviously is, is strongly uh, related to, to productivity in forest. Um, you also get, you know, that deeper penetration of, of frost that can not only impact the, the surface level kind of fine roots, but also uh, deeper roots as well. Um, and then, of course, something that I think folks in working in forestry, particularly in, in areas where, you know, winter harvesting activities are, are really kind of um, important for operations, um, those shorter, warmer winters create kind of less uh, number of days that, that folks can be out in the woods working um, and, and not damaging soils. And so uh, that this figure on the right hand side comes from a paper uh, uh, from Wisconsin, from Adina Rissman's lab at U University of Wisconsin. And, and they were looking at kind of the number of days of frozen ground conditions over this period from 1950 uh, to beyond 2010. And just for all these counties in Wisconsin, just showing, you know, pretty much a, a, a consistent uh, decline in the number of days with with frozen ground conditions, um, and which create a lot of challenges. Um, and so that means that you know there's more risk of soil damage. Um, there's more risk of, of rutting and erosion occurring um, when you've got equipment out there. Um, and you've got these, these temperature swings <clears throat> and you've got these you know, changes to the snowpack and, and frozen ground conditions. Obviously that has some, some really important impacts for, for carbon in soils and for, for soil loss. All right, so we've got the good, the bad, and then um, what I'm putting in here for the ugly is invasive species. Um, this is something that I'm, I'm battling a lot on my property. Um, this is a picture here of uh, something that we can, many folks see at this right around, starting around this period of time, which is before your overstory, um, bud, buds break and the trees start leafing out, um, the, the, the layer of invasive shrubs below and the understory is, uh, already leafed out, it's already photosynthesizing, it's already taking advantage of those, uh, those warm sunny days um, because those invasives are a lot more uh, flexible in their phenology. They're, there's, um, the, our native species are just kind of less uh, phenologically um, plastic, I guess you could say. They're, 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 not, uh, they're a little bit more set in terms of when they, when they leaf out and those invasives oftentimes are already, you know, hitting the ground running <clears throat> and taking off. And, and so a lot of those invasives, you know, can really impact tree regeneration rates. You know, this is gonna be a hard scenario for, for a, a tree um, seedling to survive. And, and particularly, you know, with uh, species that are less shade tolerant, um, you know, I. Just a, a quick story that I had a um, prior to, to moving here to, to Maine, I was in, in Indiana for a few years and there was a place that I liked to go hike. And um, just cause they had a lot of trails next to a, to a nice lake. Um, but there was an area where there was a lot of invasives, a lot of honeysuckle and, and buckthorn in there. And when EAB came through, it, it really, um, killed off much of the overstory, which was a lot of ash. And because of all, you know, because of all of the um, invasives, there just was nothing to speak of in terms of regeneration. And, and it just looks terrible. You know, I mean, there's just like a lot of standing dead trees and, and nothing but shrubs underneath. And so it's kind of the worst case scenario. Uh, 
um, certainly from from a forest health um, car, uh, standpoint, but also you know really from a carbon standpoint. <clears throat> All right, so moving from shifting seasons now, some of the shifting patterns. Um, I think one place to start uh, would just be to thinking to be thinking about the shifting patterns of precipitation. And these maps kind of show the four seasons and projections for percent change in precipitation for end of century relative to uh, to 1976 to 2005 average. And I believe this is uh, for the high emission scenario, RCP 8.5. Um, and, and I think what really is the take home message from, from this is two things on the top, those two winter and spring, those red dots indicate that there's, uh, that the, the change is high relative to the interannual variability. So what this is saying is that essentially there's, there's a high confidence that things are going to get wetter in winter and spring in you know, much of the northern tier of states from, from the northeast uh, through, to, through the Midwest and, and even into some parts of the, of the northern tier of the western states. Um, and then in the bottom left, those summer uh, patterns are, are showing essentially maybe slightly drier conditions for, for parts of the Midwest in particular, um, but that hatching suggests that, um, that the change is going to be fairly low relative to just the natural variability. So much less confidence in terms of kind of reduced summer precipitation. But what we do know is that you know, temperatures are also warming. Um, and so when you kind of, uh, and, and we also know that just precipitation is kind of coming in sort of bigger slugs of rain and, and more longer duration of dry periods in between. So even if the, the sort of the annual amount doesn't change, that there are these Periods where we anticipate more frequent and severe drought to occur, even you know, even if we're getting kind of the, the, the same total amount of precipitation. Um, and so, when you kind of put that together, um, we we do anticipate there to be um, more frequent and severe drought. And so, these are some maps that were put together by some colleagues of ours. Um, Steve Matthews was a lead on this publication. And one of the things that they looked at here was uh, the cumul cumulative drought severity index and projections for, for those changes. And so that top map just shows sort of the baseline, which just shows, you know, relatively little um, uh, drought severity index. Um, and when, and so those maps on the left hand side show the low emission scenario, mid century on the top, late century on the bottom and then high emission scenario on the right hand side. And, you know, essentially what you can see is that, you know, for low emissions in the mid-century scenario, a, a pretty significant amount of, uh, of change in terms of the drought severity index projections uh, for both the Northeast and the Lake States. And, and of course, when you look at late century under high emissions, there's a lot of red on that map. Um, and, and, but you can see, again, there's you know, a lot of spatial variability. But um, I think the take home is just that we would be into our project, these projections suggest we should be anticipating more frequent and severe drought. So what does that mean? Well, let me just, back up here for just a second. So those anticipated Im impacts, you know, are kind of a number of, of things, factors that really impact carbon, carbon sequestration and carbon storage, tree health, tree regeneration, tree productivity. So I'm going to kind of just dig into each one of these a little bit more. Um, impacts on productivity. You've seen um, this figure from from previous um, slides in, in uh, I think it was last week's lecture. Um, and I wanna just point out that, that yellow arrow 
uh, is from 2012 in that hardwood site uh, shown in red. You know, there was, there was a strong dip in um, the net ecosystem productivity, which just as a reminder, that's kind of the net change in ecosystem carbon. So it's the carbon inputs from photosynthesis and then subtracting out all the carbon outputs primarily from plant respiration and uh, heterotrophic respiration. So all the fungi and bacteria in the soil uh, decomposing things. And so essentially you get down to zero here uh, in, that, in that year um, for, for their data from this uh, paper from, from Finzi et al, which just kind of shows that the inputs equaled the output. So there was no real net gain of carbon in that year. And, um, you know, again, attribution can oftentimes be difficult, to, especially when you got like a single site, uh, a single location here. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a probably a, a strong probability that, that this um, this change in productivity, this dip in productivity had, was probably related to the, the drought that they experienced in that year, which was particularly severe. So, so take home message here being, you know, those, those drought years can really impact the productivity of a forest stand and, and turn it from a carbon, a strong carbon sink to, so, you know, a net source or, or possibly just no no net change, no net gain. <clears throat> so just in general, when we're thinking about, you know, this change in precipitation from uh, wetter to drier conditions, changes in temperature from cooler to warmer conditions, you know, we kind of expect that for, for some species, they're going to cross over this mortality threshold um, where, you know, currently we have low mortality rates. And we're going to um, expect probably in these drier, um, droughtier uh, periods of time to see higher mortality. And, and so that, you know, has, you can, you can imagine impacts, you know, different, um, different ways in the, in, the, in the forest ecosystem. So, you know, showing here a, a, a seedling um, of a conifer. Of a, a probably a spruce, um, and you know spruce are one of those species that, for some regions, has a higher uh, higher vulnerability. You know, anticipated to to be potentially a climate change loser in some areas. So you know, regeneration might be particularly uh, susceptible to those drought conditions, and and. And there, that has been observed. There's been some cases. Um, this is a, a photo from one of our adaptation demonstration sites in Florence County, Wisconsin, where there was a harvest that was done, and and these are on uh, were on sandy nutrient poor soils, and there was a failure of the regeneration. So they had some really dry conditions, and um, and the site just didn't really regenerate as expected. And so, um, and this was actually a, a, a funded project to, to then look at, um, okay, well, if we could go in and do some supplemental planting, um, you know, what are some soil amendments that we might be able to look towards things like biochar. Um, and there was also, I think, wood ash applications as well to maybe help to, to get um, better establishment of these planted stock on these nutrient poor sites. Um, and so, you know, this is one example, but I think just in general, um, you know, these, these uh, drier conditions are, are expected to be more prevalent. And uh, on the left-hand side here, these are some projections for vapor pressure deficits under both low and high emission scenario for the end of century that come from the Midwest chapter of, of the um, NCA4 report, just showing a, a really a significant change in vapor pressure deficit, um, you know, both at the low emissions scenario, but under a high emission scenario, a, a really, um, um, you know, above 80% change in vapor pressure deficit. And, and so just, um, 
for, for those who have, struggle with thinking about vapor pressure deficit like, like, like I often did uh, until I was forced to really think about it working on, on, this, um, on this report, you know, it's essentially the, 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 the dryness of the air, right? And so for any given temperature, uh, you know, moisture can, uh, the air can kind of have so much uh, moisture at saturated conditions. And so um, the, the level of moisture in the air, the difference between that level of moisture in the air and saturated conditions is, is thought of that uh, vapor pressure deficit. Um, and so essentially the higher vapor pressure deficit means you're drying out plants and soils faster, more intensively. All right, so going on to our uh, third category here, shifting species. Um, this shifting species, this, this, you know, this expectation of shifting species is really you know, being driven by a lot of those shifting patterns that I just described, drying conditions, you know, um, changes in temperature, changes in, in precipitation, those sorts of things. So a lot of our northern species are projected to decline in the region because they're more sensitive, um, you know, especially if you get up into kind of the northern tier of states that has a, a higher percentage of boreal species. Um, those are, are really expected to have uh, less favorable conditions for, for continued growth and regeneration into the future. Um, you know, on the flip side, more uh, many species that are common further south would have increasing habitat, but the rate of change, of course, is outpacing the rate of movement of these species naturally through natural migration, which is why there's a lot of interest in, in discussion about you know, um, range expansion of species or assisted migration of species. And that's something that you know, we can talk more about uh, in, into the coming weeks. Um, but when you think about these you know, declines in species performance and regeneration, that obviously has uh, uh, big implications for carbon um, and for both productivity as well as storage. <clears throat> but the particulars of how that might play out are, uh, could be different. Um, and it could be different depending upon the ecosystem. It could be different depending upon the species. So if we say, you know, there's a 50% reduction in habitat suitability for a species, what does that really mean? Um, it could mean different things. It could mean uh, what I'm showing on, on the bottom right there, that you know, just kind of a, a shrinking, that the best habitats remain. This is sort of a cartoon, as you can probably imagine, of like a riparian area. Um, and so we could imagine that the best habitats remain and that, it, that riparian zone shrinks. Or Alternatively, it could mean just kind of an overall reduction in um, the quality of that habitat. So, you know, this is sort of like a bullet hole shot into our riparian system, just Im implying that, you know, that the habitat quality of the whole system just is reduced overall, and that all species um, that are, are really suited to that habitat might begin to uh, experience. Um, uh, declining uh, productivity and health. <clears throat> and then finally, our last category here, shifting stressors. You know, of course, biotic stressors, things like insect, pests, and invasive plants, you know, aren't, not all of them are directly tied to climate. I mean, pests and, and invasives are, have been something that that foresters have been dealing with for decades, um, and you know, not everything is is you know directly tied to climate change. These things are are kind of have been around for a long time, but certainly climate is is kind of turning up the dial on on the pressures of these. So you know, we know that insect pests, some insect pests are migrating northward because of the change in uh, cold temperatures in the winter, kind of just less 
uh, probability of lethal temperatures. So things like southern pine beetle, for example, are uh, moving into uh, New York and, and even um, now have been spotted in southern Maine, where I'm at. <clears throat> Other pests have, uh, because of that longer growing season, that longer length of time of frost-free conditions, have accelerated life cycles. So, uh, for example, the um, eastern larch beetle is, is really impacting uh, larch stands in parts of Minnesota. They're seeing really high rates of mortality, uh, a tamarack there. And that's because this larch beetle, which would typically have, you know, it's, in, it's uh, sort of been in, in the, the, those forest types for, for a long time, but they typically would only have one, uh, one round of, of reproduction. Uh, but because of that longer life cycle, now they're having uh, two progeny, two, two cycles of progeny. And you know, when you have that accelerated life cycle, you can have a really a, an exponential growth um, in terms of the amount of the beetle. Can you still hear me? Am I still coming yes, through? Yes, you're, you're coming through just fine. Okay, great, thanks. Um, headset did something funny there. Um, yeah, so you could just have, have a much, uh, much accelerated uh, uh, impact to the forest. Invasive plants, similar, you know, expanded ranges under warming conditions, increased competitiveness also of invasives from elevated CO2. Um, there's been a couple of interesting studies that have shown things like um, uh, poison ivy can, can really respond uh, in terms of its productivity um, very quickly to elevated CO2 levels, um, much more than some of our native species. So similar to what I showed uh, with that image of the, the honeysuckle, you know, just kind of those invasives can just really respond to the changes uh, more, more than a lot of our natives can. <clears throat> There's an interesting study that came out a couple of years ago uh, out of uh, some researchers uh, with at Purdue University and, and the Forest Service that just was looking at the top 15 forest pests and diseases in the U.S. and, and just showing that you know about 40 percent of the live biomass in forests are at risk from just our currently established insect pests and they kind of to put a carbon number on that they estimated that about five and a half teragrams which is um, about the same thing as five and a half million metric tons of carbon uh, could be impacted above background rates of, of mortality. Now, I have kind of struggled with understanding what this means. The, you know, five and a half million metric tons of carbon impacted from, from tree mortality because, of course, a tree dies. That doesn't mean the carbon goes back up into the atmosphere. And so, I was really um, happy to see that there was another more recent paper that came out um, by um, folks uh, with FIA that um, analyzed remeasurement data from FIA plots uh, from 21 to 2019. Um, and so this kind of made, uh, I think, kind of put numbers in, in, in perspective from that, uh, that previous paper in a way that kind of made a little bit more sense to me. And, and from these remeasurement plots, uh, which you can see the map kind of focused mostly on the Eastern US, there was no remeasurement in the Intermountain West and then some remeasurement along uh, the West Coast there. And what their data suggested was that um, there was a 69% reduction in carbon sequestration in plots that were impacted by insects and about a 28% reduction in carbon sequestration in plots that were impacted by, uh, by disease, uh, by tree diseases. And so putting those two together, they put a number of about almost 13 teragrams of carbon per year or 13 million metric tons of carbon per year. Um, and so their, their confidence interval was about from between eight to 17. 
So that's pretty significant. That's about a 9% reduction in annual sequestration rates, which is equivalent to, um, they estimated about 10 million passenger cars um, being driven in a year. So yeah, I, I just felt like those numbers, you know, really made sense because that really is kind of connecting it to, um, to sequestration um, and to something that I, I think was a lot more uh, understandable. <clears throat> of course, uh, a lot of those shifting patterns that I talked about in terms of, of um, the temperature and precipitate precipitation changes that can you know impact just forest health forest you know um, yeah just forest health that that can make things more susceptible more trees and, and ecosystems more susceptible and so you know off the Department of Defense has described climate change as a threat multiplier and I think that that kind of thinking, is very relevant to thinking about ecosystems as well. And so, you know, we can just kind of imagine, you know, multiple um, stressors and impacts kind of happening in succession. Um, this cartoon here uh, from Bartlett Tree Experts, I think just kind of shows it from a single tree's perspective really well, where you can have a healthy, mature tree and it gets stressed from drought and then it gets injured from a windstorm and then after that, it gets hit by, you know, some, some insect pest. It might just be something native like a forest tent caterpillar or, uh, or an invasive insect pest like spongy moth. Um, but you can kind of imagine the, the succession of, of impacts that just ultimately, uh, you know, results in, in mortality of, of that once healthy tree. And so the interactions really do make a lot of the difference. Um, and there was a, a, a nice paper that kind of described this, um, I think more from a Western perspective and wildfire, but, um, but I think it's equally true um, in, in other forest types uh, throughout the US is that, you know, forests have always experienced disturbance and recovered from them. Um, but what we're thinking about and what we're concerned with is sort of those compounding effects. And so, you know, when there's constant risk, you can have, can imagine, well, forests can have an, uh, an impact that's sort of localized and it can recover. And ultimately you're not really, you know, changing the amount of carbon, the amount of forest cover on the landscape. But when you have this increasing risk and these compounding effects of drought and uh, here, what they're showing is, of course, drought and an insect um, like mountain pine beetle and wildfire, that, that those compounding effects can really over the long term mean you know, a, a reduction of forest tree cover, a reduction of carbon across the landscape. All right, so um, that's all I have. The, you know, the, I think there's a lot more that we could probably say about this, but I wanted to um, just end, end things here. I'm gonna um, stop the recording if I can pull that up and, uh, and then we'll go to just some questions.